continuing the process. All right, we're up and we're in <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Does everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, right, faith. And does everybody remember the big takeaway from last week? And we're going to do it anyway, so... Um, the big takeaway is actually from the week before. Faith leads us to respond to what God says, and our obedience has the reward of himself. That's pretty good. I remembered the summary because I just looked at it yesterday morning or something. All right. That was one of your summaries. All right. This is how faith works right there. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. This is an unretouched photograph of how faith works. Mm -hmm. God makes a promise. That's his word. The person who receives that promise believes that word, believes it's God talking. Mm -hmm. Then he acts on that promise, and then God fulfills his promise. Mm -hmm. Right? We got that by working backwards. We asked, who approved? And the answer is God. And he approved the men of old. Why? Because his word came to them, things that were not yet here that God was going to do, and they believed it. They didn't see it, but because God said it, they go, then that's what's going to happen. And so they had endurance to receive what God had promised. And then God says, well done, good and faithful servant. So if you haven't seen like last week, we started really chapter 11. So that is already up on YouTube if you need to catch up. But here we have Noah. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned about by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. All right. Fifteen second pause while we figure out what in the world do we do with this? <laughs> well, where is the word of God in this verse? Where's the promise or the word of God hmm. that came to Noah? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Ah, I got it. Okay. In, he, he, One person has it. In reverence, prepared an ark. All right. Uh, so, act, well, actually, no, God warned. We're waffling here. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. This is what it's about. We're jamming on this. Right. So his, his, Noah's response was preparing an ark, but it's in mm -hmm. response to God warning. All right. Here's the word of God then. Mm-hmm. God warned him, mm -hmm. but God also said, I want you to build an ark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was part of it. We have to go back to Genesis. To I see think that. we have to go back to Genesis to see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go to Genesis. Six. Okay. And it's right here in, in uh, verse 13. 
He says, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. All right? So God is warning him. He says, I'm about to destroy the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall... You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself. It shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. All right, there's the entire word of God that came to Noah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is where God says, the end of all flesh has come before me. Warning. I am about to destroy them with the earth. And then over here in verse 17, it says, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. So God is telling him he's going to destroy the earth with a flood, a, a flood that nobody's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to our text, you'll notice that here, these are th things not yet seen. So what are those things not yet seen? The end of all flesh. Okay. What else? What else hasn't been seen yet? The flood, the rain. Okay, flood. <clears throat> there was no rain up to then to that time on the earth was there okay rain uh, so remember that God also uh, was very specific about the ark mm. yeah the measurements and the wood that he that we needed. And you know, uh, you know, they didn't build a bigger ship than the Ark till about the 1800s. Hmm. So it'd be roughly uh, four and a half thousand years before they would build a bigger boat than what God told Noah to do. And you know, they, they've done tests on that kind of shape and the proportions. And scientists have determined that that arc would be virtually impossible to tip over. The, the width, height, and length make for such a stable 
vessel that it would be virtually impossible uh, to tip it over or so it would remain stable even in a completely unstable environment such as the flood. So God knew what he was doing and uh, designed a super stable container to put everything. Oh, there's another one. So all the animals are going to come to him. Mm, oh, yes. All right. So he wasn't supposed to go out and get them. God says, I'm going to make them come to you. Incredible, isn't it? It is. And he was supposed to take his sons. And his son's wives with them. Now, you know, uh, the movie that a few years came out with about Noah that was wildly inaccurate. Uh, one of Noah's sons didn't have a wife. And, uh, you know, I don't know how you could read the Bible which is the only source we've got for the story and just the fact that all three of Noah's sons had wives. Yes. But I guess the director decided to sort of jam on the subject and make his own, you know, details of the story. And so he has Ham, the son of Noah, head out into a brave new world all by himself and see what's going to happen to him. Well, wildly inaccurate. So, we come back to verse 7 here. It says, by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. And we've listed them here. Are there any others? Did we... Uh, I don't think we missed anything. Well, then what was his response to the word of God? Anybody? He started building. He, yeah? Say it, John. No, that's it. That's what I was going to say. Uh, in reverence, he prepared the ark. Okay. He prepared an ark. And it says here, it's for the salvation of his household. Mm. Now, you know, that's not exactly what God said, but that is the effect of what God said, right? Mm. Let's go back and check. Well, you know what he's saying here, I will establish my covenant with you and you okay. shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your mm -hmm. wife. So, and your son's wives. Mm -hmm. With you. So yeah. God intends to save Noah's family. Yeah. That was obvious. Isn't that interesting? So by faith, Noah not only avoided being destroyed, but he saved his whole family. Now, notice um, you know, he also saved all the animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, Anything that didn't get on the ark didn't make it. Is that true? Well, maybe, you know, there are some sea creatures. Leviathan. Leviathan, blue whales. Mm -hmm. Sharks. 
Now, that's interesting. How's that? No, I'm just looking at the next phrase already. By which he condemned the world. He just by his by his obedience. Is that well? He just showed them to be more disobedient, or by which he condemned the world. Let's look up the word in the original language. Mm -hmm. And for that, we got to go back to this. Mm -hmm. And and that means to pr pronounce sentence against, condemn, hmm. and judge guilty. Hmm. You know, um, God says they've corrupted themselves upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Every thought of their hearts was only evil continually. And so it's interesting that what it's saying is, is that as Noah was carrying out the will of God, it was, well, he condemned the world. That he said the world is wrong. Give judgment against. Let's look it up in the dictionary. Woo. To declare to be reprehensible, wrong, or evil, usually after weighing evidence and without reservation. Here's another one. To pronounce guilty. guilty. To sentence, to doom. Yeah. Now, look at this. To a judge unfit for use or consumption. Used like to condemn an old apartment building. Now, just for kicks, I want to look up the thesaurus. Look at this. To declare to be morally wrong or evil. You know, anybody else could have built an ark in that same time. It took Noah something like 120 years to build this ark. It's amazing. And probably what he was doing, an ark that size. Have you ever seen pictures of the one that's over in the United States? A group of creation scientists had it built. And it's huge. Hmm. People must have known about it. And, you know, uh, the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And evidently, he said, God told me to build this ark because he's going to destroy the earth with a flood. He probably told him everything, and they probably mocked him. But you know, the very act of his obedience declared the entire world to be wrong. So in the very same act of saving his family, also told the rest of the world, you're wrong. But then there's another effect that happened here. He not only condemned the world, but he also became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Anybody know awesome. what? The, yeah. Talk, John Balaji. Uh, sorry, Ruf. Um, now, just to add to what you're saying, uh, this is from the what version is this? This is the Logos Bible, and it, it says uh, by which he pronounced sentence, and the uh, the word pronounced it gives like I don't know what it is on the Hebrew of what you've got there, but it kind of just refers as in sentenced as well. Mm -hmm. so, so it's so it's, it's quite interesting it's almost like in which he sentenced sentence like right. a, a double a double kind of sentence so with pronounced it's it kind of hints or gives um uh, clarification, uh, clarification yeah to say that 
in his condemning, it was, you could see that he, he wasn't silent about it. So even though he might have been building the ark, uh, connected to his, his faith, he was actively or verbally condemning as well. Mm-hmm. If you if you know what I mean, I'm sure in some parts it says about how he preached or yeah, is it is it in First Peter or somewhere else? So just to add to what you're saying, a bit like how you know we believe in Jesus, but we also have to talk about the faith as well, why we believe it. So you kind of see his actions, mm-hmm. but he's also talking about it. So the yeah. condemning is verbal as well as active. Yeah. If you know what I mean. I don't know what you've got there for the Hebrew there. Yeah. Preacher well, check this out. A preacher of righteousness. So. That's, this is now Second Peter 2, 5. Yeah, that's, that's what I was referring and to. And yeah. it talks about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. Yeah. That's uh, quite So a... he preached. Mm-hmm. That was his big excuse. You know, some guys carrying around a cross and then they talk about Jesus. Well, Noah built an ark and he talked about it. That was his conversation opener. <laughs> Icebreaker. I see you're building a big wooden thing. Why, that's true. I am. Uh, any reason why you're building a big wooden thing? Well, let me tell you. Makes me wonder how many, how much they were, did any, anything with boats or anything on the water or anything. No idea. Yeah. You're not told it's, it's, the sporting habits of the antediluvians. Well, yeah, but I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it is, it is interesting because you kind of think. Uh, they is, have the concept. Yeah, and just you're we're kind of getting a. You can't. I mean, you can't miss what this guy is doing. So you're kind of getting a visual. Uh, uh, presentation of his faith in God, if you know what I mean. Yes. yes. So mm-hmm. it's so kind of like how how it is for us that it's not something that we should just be like. It's it has to be a visual thing as well. Not in the sense that we just, I know about, we're going out and doing, we're do, going out and evangelizing and things like that, which is acceptable. But you just see, I mean, you can't, you can't miss an arc that, of that size. So it's not in, it's not in hiding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let this little light shine. <laughs> Ooh, that's really good. What's that? Uh, Joni yeah. said, I'm going to let my little light shine. Oh, right. Yeah. And that's, I think, what John is getting at. Yes. So I wrote down here, faith is visual, and it's open to the public. It's bold, boldness, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, actually. Yes, because he was acting on God's word. Yes. He knew what was coming. And <laughs> nobody else saw it. Nobody else believed him. And most likely, they mocked him. Mm, yes. And they mocked God because they knew about God, but they didn't give him thanks. Mm. So they didn't believe God. And Noah was saying, God is going to destroy the earth. And they just said, no way, man. Not going to happen. Like, um... Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I'm just thinking about... Um, oh. Ignore it. Sorry. I was just thinking about someone in the Bible as well, that nobody believed him, that the Lord said what he was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh. One more time. One more time. Oh. There was a fellow who, I can't remember his name, ignore it. You know, he was, uh, the Lord told him he was going to destroy. Lot? Oh, Lot. Yeah. Lot. That's it, Lot. 
and nobody believed him. Everybody mocked him as well. Yeah, that's right. His sons thought he was just crazy. Now I wrote this down because it also occurred to me: faith is not a majority. That is, it doesn't matter if everybody else doesn't believe it. How? What's a better way to put that? Hmm. Faith is not a majority. I don't even know what exactly I'm trying to say there, but can I say that? Mm-hmm. Say it again. Majority opinion. Ah. Or just plan on being in the minority. <laughs> Hey. That's not. Just- I mean, pretty pretty much how you, sorry, uh, pretty much how you had it was quite cool as well. Because in the verse six, when it says that uh, now without faith it is impossible to please God. I mean that that doesn't give any other funnel or ad- other way than that way yeah so it's impossible i mean that's as narrow as it gets it doesn't get any narrower than that and okay it really Check this out in all of noah's lifetime only five people believed him his wife his three sons there are three wives, so that adds up. That's more than five. Seven. That's seven. Seven. Seven people believed him in his whole life. Nobody else believed him. I you mean, think that, that is- Noah could have said, what am I doing this for? <laughs> Nobody believes me. Everybody thinks I'm wacko. Everybody's making fun of me. What is the fruit from this thing? 120 years building this thing. I don't know if I ever want to see wood ever again. I mean, to be a bit of a, if not a rad, devil's advocate, I mean, it doesn't really kind of give showing to even his family believe in him. Mm-hmm. It you know kind of... I, I'm not saying that's not possible. I mean, it's, the emphasis is on just him being the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. And I know we don't see grace here, as in the word grace, but I can't imagine why we couldn't see the grace of God with faith here. Because it's when it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. I mean, this is something you, you do, you're hoping for it, but it's not yet come. See that? Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. That's Found grace. Favor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Favor is grace. And, I, and I'm just, You're exactly on the money. Mm-hmm. I'm, just hint, I'm just hinting the fact that I'm not saying that they didn't believe him, but like you said, for the amount of years that this guy is building this thing, I can't believe that well, I don't know. Who knows? We don't know where their faith stood, but he continued to obey God. And like you just pointed out, the favor was found in in the eyes of the Lord. So it's like, I mean, that's grace. <laughs> he was 500, 500 years, years. Old, wow. And he became, in that, that uh-huh. century, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Three sons, and he waited until he was 500 to have kids because the world was so gross. Mm. That's how gross the world was. And then he, he had three sons and somehow got them married. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
So he did find favor in the eyes of the Lord. And that's the whole point. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And remember, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Yes. That's exactly what Enoch did. Mm. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. All right. So let's get back. An heir. You know what an heir is? Possessor. Legal possessor. So that's what an heir is. He is a possessor of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, you know, that's how we receive righteousness. By faith. In exactly the same way. Because we hear the word about Jesus. And we believe it and we act upon it. So the very same faith by which Noah was saved is the faith by which we are saved. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Do you want to go on to verse 8? It's amazing. Sorry, Joni. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm only saying it because this is before Christ. And I can't remember where we, yeah, we have read about how, because they didn't believe it was a mix but with faith before Christ. And you kind of realize, like you've just said, this is the same faith. It's, there's no other way. There's no other faith. It's the same continuous you have to believe the word of god yeah mm -hmm. even yeah. though christ sorry god you know that makes noah a prophet because yeah. he received the word of god so therefore i've written the word prophet over noah he is a prophet mm. because he received that word of god and he spoke it. We're yet to see Abraham, but you do see here that he was accredited righteousness too. It's just not written in the same format as how it is for Abraham, because he became an he became the heir of righteousness. Yes, mm -hmm. that is exactly the same thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's not written in the same way. That's all Romans 4, is that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And that yeah. is Genesis 15. Exactly the same thing. That's quite big. I can prove that briefly. I, I had forgotten just how that is because you, you can't forget if you know what I mean. Say it again? You can't forget sometimes because the emphasis, we do get quite hooked on that thing of, oh, it was credited to Abraham as righteousness, which is understandable. But this is Noah before Abraham. <laughs> yes. yes. Now look, God took Abraham outside and says, now look to the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, has Abraham seen his descendants yet? Mm -hmm. No. All he has to go on is the word of God, his promise. And all Abraham did was believe God and say, God is true. So, the very same thing as Noah. By the way, Abraham is receiving the word of God. So, Abraham is a prophet.
All right. As long as we're on Abraham, might as well do verse 8. All right. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Isn't that kind of interesting? Mm -hmm. He didn't know where he was going. I'm going to receive an inheritance. That's fabulous. Where's that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. That's interesting, too. Where am I going? Here's the word of God. <laughs> the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. He didn't tell him where it was. Mm -hmm. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. Mm. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Mm. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now you know, if you look at this, that um, Abram was supposed to leave Ur of the Chaldees, but he left with his father. And God says, you're supposed to leave your father's house. Mm -hmm. But his father went with him. Mm -hmm. And they went as far now they went to enter the land of Canaan and they went as far as Haran and settled there. So he didn't just like take off immediately and just, you know, gotta go. I, I'm not sure where I'm going, but boy, I'm going. He kind of settled down in Haran. And then his father died there. And that's where God says, go out. Go out. So then Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. The Lord's so patient. Yes. <clears throat> it's act of obedience, isn't it? You know, just the Lord asking him to go and then didn't even question the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So they uh, evidently went to Canaan, and then the Lord showed up and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So it was, oh, this is it. So let's go back and see what the verse says. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Isn't that interesting? The first thing he had to do was go out. And it was only after he went out that God supplied the next step. But leaving was a big deal, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So we can say this. Leaving was a big deal. You know, they had flush toilets in Ur of the Chaldees. How'd you like to go from flush toilets to living in a tent for the rest of your life? No, thanks. By the way, let me ask a question. Has Abraham received his inheritance yet? No. No, he hasn't. No. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, you know, when God gives it to him, he's going to own it forever. God didn't want to give him a temporary <laughs> inheritance. Isn't that interesting? 
Let's put that one in red just for kick. All families will be blessed. There is no indication of anyone, any other line or any other person, all families. Yeah. Yeah. Bless mm. I'm going to bless the whole earth through you. Now, look what it says in verse 9. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So, God doesn't want to give a temporary inheritance. He's looking for a permanent city. A permanent city. And the city is built by God. Isn't that fantastic? So it's not an earthly city. So, you know, he lived in tents because God told him to. And it was a foreign land. He was a foreigner his whole life there. I know a little bit about what it means to be a foreigner. We all do. Yes. Isn't that amazing? I'm a foreigner. <laughs> Well, fellow foreigners, this is your land, I Rob. <laughs> Beg your pardon? This is your land. This is your land. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, John? <laughs> now I mean, I mean, or in the future? In the future. <laughs> yes. I'm going to inherit the earth. Amen. So are you guys. Good thing we're meek, huh? <laughs> Boy, if we weren't meek, we'd have a tough time with that one. But look at an alien. What's it? He was an alien. My my great forefathers were aliens. Let's look up the word alien, shall we? <laughs> Bug-eyed monster. Wait a sec. Huh? Just kidding. <laughs> Belonging or relating to another person, place, or thing. Strange. Uh -huh. Be relating, belonging, or owing allegiance to another country or government. Mm -hmm. Foreign. Mm -hmm. well, that's more like. Yes. Coming from another world. Extraterrestrial. <laughs> Now, I've just got to say this. When we look at this, um, I got to show you something. These are the scriptures I'm going to teach on uh, on Sunday, and look what look what Jesus says here. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And literally, from here, my kingdom is not from here. From here. Yeah. No, Jesus is really an alien. He comes from another world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's making the sign of the Illuminati. Sorry. She's in the study, but she's not of the study. Wait a sec. She's, she's in this with us, even though she's in the next room. She's an extraterrestrial. She's listening to our teaching. Yes. Good. 
So look at this quote down here. Mm -hmm. When it comes to knowing what alien life forms might be like, we don't have any idea. That's the truth. Because Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And Abraham's, was, Abraham was the same way. That's why he was happy to live in a tent. Yeah. He wasn't collecting stuff except goats and sheep and cattle. Yeah. But he was looking for the city which has foundations. And you know, no city currently has foundations. The buildings do, but not the city. So you have an earthquake in, in a place like Osaka, Kobe, um, and, and the cities just crumble. Mm. Even though those Japanese cities are built to resist earthquakes, they have them every month there. Yes, yeah. But still, an earthquake is going to level a city because the city itself doesn't have a foundation. But the city we're looking for and the city that Abraham is looking for has foundations because God built it. Yeah. So... Mm. Guess what? God says he owns the entire land. But he only owned a little bit of it. Do you know what part he owned? He actually bought it. He bought a piece of land. At the burial place, I can't remember the name of it. It was the Cave of Machabah. The Cave of Machabah. All right, and you know what that means? It was a graveyard. Yes, that's, that's, what he buried, he buried. that's all he ever owned, was a graveyard. Wow. Yeah. That's so mad. <laughs> and guess what else? He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? So... This is the crazy thing. In order for Abraham to receive his inheritance, God has to raise him from the dead. And that's our inheritance. We don't get our inheritance until God raises us from the dead. Now, we might pass from earthly existence to heavenly existence in a split second. If we live to see the rapture, we're going to pass from these lowly bodies to a heavenly body like the body of Jesus right now, and we will receive all of our inheritance in that split second. That can happen at any time. But you know what we're doing until then? By faith, we are living as an alien in the land of promise. Dwelling in tents. You know what a tent is? Yeah. It's temporary. temporary. Yeah, temporary. And uh, somebody has observed that a tent is skin stretched over poles. Yeah. Get that? Yep. So we've got poles. We've got bones in our body, and then we have skin stretched over that. We live in tents. And this is what, this is what the apostle says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a home not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in indeed in this house, this tent, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Mm -hmm. 
in as much as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we're in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. So the Holy Spirit living in us is God's earnest, his down payment to say that he will fulfill his promise to us. And I'm going to show you in Philippians, he says, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So we are truly not belonging down here. We are foreign. But where we belong is in heaven. That is our home. That's our homeland. Even more than that country from which we came. We belong there in heaven with Jesus, with the Father. That's where we belong. That's where our citizenship is. Like, you know that feeling when you go back to your home country and you just show your national passport and they let you in. And there's not even a question because you're a citizen. Mm -hmm. And they don't look at you funny and they don't make fun of your accent. Mm -hmm. You fit right in because that's your home. Well, our citizenship is in heaven. We can just walk right in because we have the passport. And do you know what the passport for heaven is? Jesus. 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 Yeah. And you know, specifically, it's the cross of Christ. Yeah. No cross, no glory. Yeah. So that's why, for now, we suffer, we're humbled, mm -hmm. we're foreigners, and we have to put up living in a foreign land because we don't belong here. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know that just the fact that God has given us his Holy Spirit, that's our guarantee that we are going to inherit. So that's where we're headed. So we don't want to set our mind on earthly things. We want to keep thinking about heaven. Everybody get that? Yes. So it might sound really corny, but you really do not belong here. Well, any other questions before, before we're done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Heavenly Father, that you show us these things and you show us the consistency of Scripture, that there's always, only, ever, been one way to you and that is through faith in your word and in these last days it's been so clarified that we have to have faith in Jesus 
who is the word of God. And we do believe in your word, Jesus, tonight. We're so thankful for Jesus coming to us and taking our sins away forever. We're so thankful that you raised him from the dead. And we're so thankful that he is coming back again. And maybe the entire world is going to say that is never going to happen. You guys are fools and you're dangerous. We pray that you would strengthen our faith so that we can endure and persevere until you take us out of the world. And so we shall always be with the Lord Jesus. That's where we're headed. So help us now to not lose the plot. And we pray that you would fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm going to pray for um, Ophelia, too.